Thanks, Pastor David. Uh, well, just some a brief information on myself before we get into the, uh, uh, the message. Uh, thank you very much for the hour. That's, that's really good to know. I've got a whole hour I can uh, spend here. Hopefully it'll be interesting for you all. Uh, I've been a pastor for about 20 years uh, up in Cairns uh, for a while. Uh, Atherton, anybody from know the Atherton Tablelands at all up in North Queensland? Uh, Cairns, Atherton, and the past 10 years roughly um, in Gladstone and uh, a couple of churches. I've been a school teacher as well for about 15 years in uh, Christian schools and currently in state schools. I've done a fair bit of RI teaching as well. And I've uh, been involved in creation evangelism since the mid-90s. So it's a passion of mine and uh, uh, the, the topic of course is be prepared. Uh, this message, it's not going to be so much heavy on the science aspects, but really it's more to do with how to use the material that you'll have a look at uh, in, just a, in just a minute. So can we just pray and then we'll, uh, we'll get into the message. Dear Father, we thank you for this uh, wonderful opportunity to share with these people. Uh, we thank you that we are your children. We thank you for the assurance we have in you, the love that we have, the forgiveness of sins and all the things that we were singing about this morning. And uh, Father, we pray that you would work by your Holy Spirit this morning uh, through, the, through your word, through this message to bless and encourage and help us to be better equipped to serve you and uh, to reach out to a, a, hurt, a hurting world, a dying world with uh, your wonderful message. And we ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 and 16. Peter says, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Key words are be prepared. The Bible tells us to be prepared with answers. So what sort of questions do we need to be prepared to actually answer? Uh, some of you may be familiar with questions like this. Hasn't evolution proved the Bible wrong? Even if people don't ask the question, it's a common assumption that evolution has disprove the Bible, and you can't really believe in Genesis, can't really trust the, the biblical account of origins. How can the creation story in Genesis be literally true? Don't fossils and dinosaurs prove evolution? How can you say Christianity is the only true religion? How can a loving God allow death and suffering? And that is a big question. It's a big uh, stronghold of the enemy that uh, oftentimes prevents people from seriously considering whether the Bible may be true. They kind of know there's a God out there, they feel there, there's a God who made everything, but look at how messed up the world is. It's a broken world, it's a hurting world. So always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Here's a, a question uh, that Sir David Attenborough has, or had uh, some years ago. He was asked by a reporter uh, the question, yeah, why don't you give glory to God? You, you, you see creation, you see so much of creation all over the world, you produce these amazing documentaries. Why don't you give glory to God for what he has created? Here's what he said. When creationists talk about God creating every individual species as a separate act, they always instance hummingbirds or orchids, sunflowers, and beautiful things. But I tend to think instead of a parasitic worm that is boring through the eye of a boy sitting on the bank of a river in West Africa. A worm that's going to make him blind. And I asked them, are you telling me that the God you believe in, who you also say is an all-merciful God who cares for each one of us individually, are you saying that God created this worm that can live in no other way than in an innocent child's eyeball? Because that doesn't seem to me to coincide with a God who is full of mercy. Right? That is a good question. Are you prepared to answer a question like that or a similar question? Do you believe in God? Well, my mother died of Alzheimer's. I know somebody who's dying of cancer. Is that your God? Is that the kind of God you believe in? We need to be prepared to answer questions like that. There was a poll conducted by George Barner, Christian pollster George Barner revealed that up to 70% of Christian children brought up in a Christian home and in the church will walk away from the faith after they leave home. Now look at that figure, 70%. That is an alarming figure, a frightening figure. A chaplain from Macquarie University says this, 
Our surveys indicate that 80% of first year students believe in a God who is there. By their second year, only 15% believe in God. Evolution very clearly erodes the faith. Richard Dawkins on why he rejected God. He was asked, was there a particular point or something that you read or an experience you had that said, yes, this is it, God doesn't exist? Richard Dawkins said, well, by far the most important, I suppose, was understanding evolution. I think there really is a deep incompatibility between evolution and Christianity. And I think I realized that at the age of about 16. And he's right. There is an incompatibility between evolution and the Bible. You cannot fit evolution with the Bible, as we'll see this morning. Julia Gillard, uh, she shares, I think this is uh, in her book, My Story. She says, in my formative years, church figured strongly in my life. I was a regular attender at the Baptist Sunday School and then a keen participant in its youth group. Belief in God was an unquestioned part of my world until my late teens. There was no cataclysmic moment of revelation, but as I moved into my 20s, doubts grew and then overwhelmed. I asked all the questions that beset so many people with and without faith. How can you rationalize so much suffering in our world with the existence of a benevolent or good God? And that is a very, very good question. So in this whole debate of creation versus evolution, what is at stake? Number one, the character of God. Is God good? Right? That is a, a legitimate question. It is a messed up, broken, hurting world. How can God be good? That is a reasonable question that people have. The gospel message itself is at stake as well. This is uh, something that, uh, this is a quote from an evolutionist, Frank Zindler, American atheist, in a debate with William Craig. He says this, the most devastating thing though that biology did to Christianity was the discovery of biological evolution. Of course, he's assuming evolution is true. Now that we know that Adam and Eve never were real people, the central myth of Christianity is destroyed. If there never was an Adam and Eve, there never was an original sin. If there never was an original sin, there is no need of salvation. If there is no need of salvation, there is no need of a saviour. And I submit that puts Jesus, historical or otherwise, into the ranks of the unemployed. I think that evolution is absolutely the death knell of Christianity. So we need to be prepared to give answers to the questions that people have, and we don't need to be intimidated by such questions. I'm going to share with you just quickly three ways in which you can be prepared. Uh, number one, Creation Magazine. We actually have some of these um, on display. Uh, it's a free gift if you choose to subscribe. How many of you actually subscribe already? Anybody subscribe? A couple? All right. So I'll share more about that a little bit later, but have a look at the magazine. If you do decide to subscribe today, there is one uh, waiting for you that's for free. There's also a website. Who's heard of this website? Creation.com. Very, very easy uh, uh, website to remember. If you're thinking, you know, what's the, what's the answer to this question or that question on creation or evolution, go to creation.com. There is a, uh, a search box on the top, keyword search. You can do a topical search. Uh, there's a, uh, an article, daily feature article, six days out of seven. There's a, it gets refreshed. There's a new article almost every day. In addition to the, uh, the magazine and the website, there is an email newsletter, free email newsletter called InfoBytes. Has anybody subscribed to that at all? All right, again, there's a, a slip. Um, I think uh, Belinda was handing them out. Some of you would have received a slip with some details on the back that you can fill in. Uh, this is what it looks like in your inbox when you get the email. There are some uh, fascinating uh, titles. If you see anything that captures your interest, you can click on the link and read a little bit further. This is the little uh, slip that you would have received as you came in. Uh, on the back, you can fill in your uh, details, uh, email address, and then you'll be receiving that. We won't spam your inbox or anything. It's just every now and then there's a, something in the news comes up or there's some, uh, some topic that comes up and they'll put out a, a newsletter and then you can uh, be informed and you can be prepared to address that issue. Free video download as well with the first email. So, we're talking about what is at stake. The character of God is at stake. The gospel message is at stake. And take note of this, the authority of Scripture is at stake. The very authority of the Word of God is at stake. For example, how old is the universe? 
According to the Bible, the Bible says 6,000 years according to the genealogies in Genesis 5 and Luke chapter 3. Evolutionists, of course, say 13.8 billion years. They talk about the Big Bang, right? Billions of years. Uh, evolution over millions of years and so forth. Are these two things compatible? Of course not. Two completely different uh, timelines. And billions of years undermines the authority of the Word of God. So take a look at this, uh, this timeline. I'm sure you've all seen uh, visuals like this timeline. Sometimes they're linear. Uh, I actually had a teacher back in, uh, in high school, uh, year 11. I'll never forget, he, he was an evolutionist and he taught us. He said, look, uh, he said, watch, watch me. He went to the, we had these two big uh, blackboards at the front and he had a piece of chalk and he began over here and then dragged the chalk all the way across. He said, this is the timeline. He said, this is the big bang in the beginning over here. And he just walked along like this, took his time, went all the way to the end of the second uh, blackboard, held up his little finger, and he said, this little piece of history here is where humans fit. All right? And he said, we've only been around, look at it, where, where are humans on this timeline? Beginning or the end? Yeah. At the end, all right? Typical evolutionary timelines, they're full of millions or billions of years, and they put people way down the end of the timeline. But what does the Bible say? All right, does the Bible talk about death and suffering for millions of years? No, we have a good God. All right, where is the man on the timeline? Way down the end. The scriptures tell us, uh, Mark chapter 10 and verse 6, what did Jesus say? At the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Right, that is a time marker. All right, Jesus tells us when Adam and Eve were created. He doesn't say at the end, he says at the beginning of creation. We have uh, Mark chapter 13, verse 19. Jesus spoke about distress unequaled from the beginning when God created the world. Now, if, peer, if people are experiencing distress from the beginning of the world, they must have been there to experience that distress. It's just logical, right? Distress was experienced from the beginning when God created the world. Luke 11.50, Jesus spoke about the blood of the prophets shed since the beginning of the world. The prophets must have been there in order for their blood to be shed. And there are plenty of examples all through Scripture. Romans 1.20 says that uh, man has been without excuse since the creation of the world. If man has been without excuse, man must have been there from the beginning of the world. And so clearly the timelines are not compatible. The Bible makes it clear sin only entered the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin. It had not been happening for millions or even billions of years. So take a look at this graphic. What do you see in the picture? What do you see in there? We have Adam, we have Eve in the cartoon, we have some animals. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. We need to believe that. Now that's what the Bible says. Uh, God is good and God created a perfect world. If we try to add millions of years into that picture, look at what happens. Death, suffering, disease. We have Adam and Eve standing on a fossil graveyard. How does that fit with a God who is very good? Can you imagine Adam and Eve saying, oh Adam, yeah, this, is, this is a, a beautiful world that God made, and yes Eve, it's, it's very good, just like God said, and, and literally they're standing on a record of, of death and suffering. You look at some of these fossils, there is arthritis in there. There's cancer. You'll find some uh, animals inside other animals. They've eaten them. Right? How can that be good? How can that be described as very good? It just doesn't fit. So the authority of Scripture is undermined by evolution. Even the basis for right and wrong uh, is undermined by evolutionary thinking. Why is abortion wrong? Right? If, we are, if, if this world is full of living organisms that are different branches on, on the evolutionary tree, but a cat over on this branch, a dog over here, a baby over here, a cow over here, what's the difference? If you can kill cows and, and make hamburgers, what's wrong with killing these things that we call humans? Right? They're this, they're this, what, what's the basis for saying that one has any more value over the other? What's wrong with gay marriage? Right, if we just evolved over a long period of time, and you know, maybe we even created this idea of God and this institution of marriage, if we created that, if we came up with that idea, that this thing we call marriage, then why not redefine it? Why not make it anything that you want it to be? That's how the thinking goes when we begin to introduce millions of years into 
uh, the Bible. It just doesn't work. The new heavens and earth is at stake as well. I'm sure you all know if you study the Bible, Genesis and Revelation dovetail together, right? Genesis, we read about the, the tree of life. We find it again in the book of Revelation. In Genesis, we read about the curse when everything was corrupted. Go to Revelation, there was no longer any curse, all right? If the beginning of our timeline is actually a fossil graveyard and millions of years of death and suffering, and if we return to that at the end of our timeline, what are we returning to? More death and suffering? Bloodshed? It doesn't make sense, does it? It makes no sense. So what I want to share this morning is just a big picture overview. Uh, I want to sketch out a big picture overview of a biblical timeline. We're going to build all of our thinking on the Bible. We're going to start at the beginning. Genesis 1.1, Pastor David quoted this before. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God made the wild animals according to their kinds. We understand that. God created man in his own image. That's what separates us from the animals. This is why today, for example, it's okay to, to kill some animals for food, but it is not okay to kill or murder a human. God made us in his own image. And God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. So here are some examples of things that God created. Look at it. Isn't that beautiful? Beautiful butterfly. We have uh, swans. All right? You can see a bit of a love heart shape in there. All right? We have uh, bunny rabbits. Who likes cute animals? Join up. We're learning. All right? Beautiful little bunny rabbits. Do you guys have a cat? Any pets at home? Who has a pet at home? Right, people love animals, right? We, we have a couple of cats at home, uh, beautiful things. But, you know, if, if um, uh, was it David Attenborough? Richard, Richard's the actor, isn't he? David is the naturalist. If he was here this morning, he would say, Steve, you're showing all the, the pretty things, all right? Put up some blood and gore, and then we'll talk about your God. Right? He'll say, that's butterflies, that's bunnies, that's kittens. It's not fair, right? You're being biased, right? But we need to remember Genesis 1.30. To all the beasts of the earth, I give every green plant for food, and it was so. What about this creature? Is that cute and cuddly? All right. Mr. Attenborough would say, really? Does that, is that a plant eater? Does that look like a plant eater to you? Tigers, is that cute and cuddly? All right. He would say, Steve, this is the real world. All right. This is what your God made. Deal with it. Face up to it. How does it fit? Well, again, what's the topic of our what's the topic of our talk? <coughs> Be prepared, right? And this is just an article. Uh, this is from an article I read in Creation Magazine a few years ago. From uh, this is in Thailand, Siraka Zoo in Thailand. What they did, they had a tiger breeding program, and they raised tigers and pigs together in the same enclosure. And you can visit that zoo today. You can uh, walk in, and there's a tiger, there's a pig right next to it. Do the pigs look? Worried. Are the pigs thinking, yeah, I'm going to be this the meal, this, this tiger's next meal? No. Right? They were raised together, they were nursed together, uh, and perfectly tame. All right? And, you know, when the Bible says that everything God made was very good, that includes the cat kind, the original cat kind. And I believe that they were very good because the Bible says so. However, Creation Magazine affirms that. Right? It gives me... Uh, a story that I can tell, I can share with people. If someone is skeptical and says, your Bible says everything was vegetarian, that's a fairy tale. How can that be true? Look at lions, look at tigers. Well, I can share the story. It's a simple story. We can all read the magazine, we can tell the story, and we can be prepared to have an answer. Here's another article from Creation Magazine. The article was called Echoes of Eden. You may have seen this on the news a few years ago. This is from Kenya. A lioness adopted a baby antelope, and it did it several times. It protected it from other lions, it gathered food for it. At one point, when it was gathering food, another lion came along and killed the antelope. And uh, the game warden was observed to, uh, to see, he, he recorded the, um, the lion circling around, running around circles and making these noises, and obviously upset that the antelope had been killed. And the lioness went and adopted another antelope. I think this is, in this photo, this is the second one that it adopted. And I think it happened one or two times after that as well. It was on the news. Lions don't normally do that, right? They don't normally behave like that. But it's a story that we can tell from modern times to illustrate that the big cats can be very good. 
It's not far-fetched when you read Genesis 1 to, to believe that everything that God made was very good. There's another photo of the lion uh, and the lamb lying down together. What about piranhas? All right. Uh, if I say the word piranha, what do you think of? I think of water frothing around and blood and you know things like that. Uh, you throw something in the in the river in the Amazon, and piranhas just come and they swarm and they devour it and it's gone. Piranhas are actually omnivorous. They've been observed to eat both plant uh, matter as well as um, uh, meat. And there is a species of piranha called the pacu. It even looks friendly, doesn't it? Look at that. Look at that mouth. It almost looks like it's uh, smiling. It's called the pacu. And it is a vegetarian strand, a vegetarian uh, subspecies, you could call it, of the piranha. All right? So if someone says, well, what about piranhas? You, know, you can't seriously say that piranhas were very good. Well, yes, we can. And it's an intelligent faith that we have. It's a defendable faith. We can be prepared to share with people, yes, it is actually credible. Well, what about sharks? Surely sharks can't be very good. Yes, they can. Right? Sharks can be vegetarian. This is a nurse shark, normally a, a carnivorous shark, and it was found with a, an old rusty fish hook stuck at its jaw. The fish hook was removed, surgically removed, and the shark was donated to an aquarium in England. And uh, at the aquarium, come feeding time, they found that this shark, which was nicknamed Florence, it wouldn't eat the fish. The other sharks would come and, and eat the fish that were being fed, to them, but uh, Florence refused to eat fish. And what is it eating in the picture? Can you tell? Celery, Celery or lettuce or something like that. Right? It's, it's literally uh, became a vegetarian shark. Right? They would eat lettuce, cucumber, carrots, things like that. So yes, we can say with a straight face, uh, in all seriousness, everything was very good. It's not just a blind faith that we have, it's a credible faith. And here are some illustrations that back it up. Now, do I need them? I find them useful, right? But I believe God's word because God wrote it. It is the word of God, right? That's, that's my foundational presuppos presupposition, uh, right? God's word is true. I believe it. But isn't it handy to have stories like this up your sleeve? Right? Because otherwise, what do you do? You just say, well, I believe it. <coughs> Because it says it, and then you can sound like, well, you're just this narrow-minded, you know, person that, that uh, has a blind faith. Well, no. I, I studied science. I've been to uni. I've, uh, I'm a thinking person, and uh, it's credible. What I read in the Bible uh, matches what I see in the real world. So, quiz time. I want to ask for a show of hands. All right, we're going to just uh, imagine a scenario where you are digging in your backyard, and uh, your spade, your shovel. Uh, hits something hard, you dig around, and you dig up a skull like that. I want to ask you to raise your hands. Who says that would be the skull? Maybe of a dinosaur or something, uh, and it's a meat eater. Looks like a meat eater. Anyone? All right. Uh, we look at the teeth, for example, sharp teeth. Uh, who says plant eater? Does anyone think it looks like a plant eater? Anybody recognize the skull? It's not a T-Rex, no, no. It's the skull of a panda. Right? It's a skull of a panda bear. And what is the point of this? this? This illustrates that sharp teeth and claws does not have to mean carnivore. Right? It was just a panda skull. So you're digging in your backyard, dig a bit further, then you unearth this monstrosity, right? Big skull, uh, fangs, hands up. Is it a meat eater? Yep. <laughs> is it a plant eater? Anybody? You think it's a plant eater? It's the skull of a male camel. Again, herbivorous, it has fangs, the male camel. But uh, again, the point, the point is, sharp teeth and claws does not have to mean carnivore. Here's another one. I think it should be catching on by now. Plant eater, meat eater, who says, who says meat eater? Who says plant eater? All right, it's the skull of a fruit bat. All right, again, what is the point? Sharp teeth and claws does not have to mean Carnival, right? Let's get that into our, our, our way of thinking. Anyway, you're digging. You're still digging. Now you find this. Now this is going to stretch our minds a little bit. All right? You dig up this. What is it, Steve? Tyrannosaurus Rex. All right? What do we see? Just like the other examples, we see sharp teeth. All right? We might even find some claws. You know, the two, two finger claws. But what have we learned? 
sharp teeth and claws doesn't have to mean carnivore. So is it reasonable to think that in the beginning, a creature like this could have been a plant eater? Yes. I believe it because God's word says it, but I find these illustrations handy. I can be prepared to defend my faith and back it up uh, reasonably. So if herbivores can have sharp teeth and claws, maybe the T-Rex was a plant eater in the beginning. Remember, to all the beasts of the earth, God said, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. All means all. Of course, God's creation did not remain very good for long. We all know what happened. The Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. Now when Adam and Eve exercised their free will, they partook of that fruit, did they drop down on the ground? No, but the, the physical universe was affected. They became separated from God, but uh, the world changed. Sin entered the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin. That's when it happened. Everything became corrupted. Tell me what's wrong with this picture. Very sharp thorns, all right? Uh, if, if you, you know, hypothetically, if you were God, if you were creating the universe, why would you do that? Why would you? It's a beautiful rose. Who likes roses? All right? It's pretty. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. Why are there thorns on it? Why would you do that? All right? The plant kingdom became corrupted. This probably looks familiar to you as well. Right? Isn't this more the normal way we, we understand lions and tigers? All right? Does it, is, it, is it very good? There's something wrong here. If these animals could talk, these little um, uh, antelopes and things, if they could talk, would they say, yep, it's a very good world that God made. Here I am with this monster chasing me. It's, it's not. Right? There's something wrong with the world that we live in. The animal kingdom has become corrupted. Right? This is not very good. And uh, again, David Attenborough sees this. He says, how can there be a God? Here's one illustration again from Creation Magazine. The Vampire Finch. Has anyone heard of that? The Vampire Finch from uh, the Galapagos Islands. This is an illustration that shows us how an animal can actually change from being plant-eating to becoming a carnivore. These, these finches were uh, eating berries originally, and I think the food supply ran out on this island, and the finches, of course, have to eat. They can't go anywhere else. They're on an island. They're surrounded by water, and these finches were observed to change their diet and become carnivorous. In the photo, can you tell what the, the finch is sitting on? Can you see that? It's another bird. It is eating it alive. Right, it's perched on the back. It's opened up a wound, and it's just picking, picking it off, you know, uh, eating this bird. Uh, the larger bird, can it go anywhere? It's on an island. Right? It's just sitting there, getting eaten by these, these finches that have been named the vampire finch. So it shows that you know, th this whole concept of T-Rex being good in the beginning and then becoming carnivorous. Uh, it's not so far-fetched. We can see animals. The kia from New Zealand is another example of a, a bird that uh, has been observed to uh, attack sheep and things like that and eat ca uh, sheep carcasses and things like that. Right? It can happen. Even today, we can observe an animal changing its diet. And that must have happened before or after Adam sinned. Must be after. There can't be any death before Adam. Right? It happened after Adam sinned. So the plant kingdom uh, was corrupted, the animal kingdom, and worst of all, mankind, Adam, Eve. Right? Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. That's when death came into the world. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. King David said, surely I was sinful at birth. Right? At birth. Newborn baby. I have five children. Uh, I've been there for you know, the birth of, of every one of them. I look at this, this new child, a sinner, right? Yes, it's a cute baby, but sinful from birth because we are descended from Adam, right? My little baby, my first child, hadn't done anything, just got born. But by nature, uh, inherited Adam's sin. Right, a sinful nature, and we're born. King David understood this. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. So that's our problem. 
Uh, all of us are born into this world with a sin nature separated from God. That is the problem. And as we progress through this message, the solution uh, to that problem will become uh, increasingly clear, which I'm sure many of you know, but it's good to have that reinforced. So anyway, somebody says, what about fossils? Right, you Christians, you're talking about death only coming through Adam's sin. Well, fossils are millions of years old. There's death before Adam. What do you do with the fossils? All right, they, they ask the question, uh, don't they prove that death has been happening for millions of years? Is that reasonable? That's a, that's a good question. What do you do with fossils? You know, we all know fossils are millions of years old. There's death before Adam. How does that fit with the Bible? So here's what we need to understand. We all have the same evidence. Right, whether somebody is a creationist or an evolutionist, right, they, they'll, they'll grapple, they'll have a, a battle of worldviews. We'll use the same fossils, the same rock layers, the same everything, but we interpret those things in the context of our worldview. Let's take a look at some fossils. The coelacanth, who's heard of the coelacanth fish? It's a coelacanth, uh, that's a fossil there, uh, dated 400 million years old. I just shake my head every time I hear millions of years, I think, you know, it's on the news, on the radio, there'll be some fossils being found, and sure enough, within seconds, you have the phrase, millions of years. Uh, question for us, could humans have ever coexisted with this fish? Who says yes? Well, <laughs> that's right, that's right. Uh, when were fish created? On day five, all right, people, Adam and Eve on day six, yes, we coexisted. Um, could that apply to the coelacanth? Yes, here's a photo. Here's photographic evidence. The coelacanth fish was discovered alive off the coast of South Africa in 1938 and various other times since then. They're alive today. We coexist with them right now. Here's a, a dinosaur plant, the Wollomai pine, dated over 200 million years old. Is it possible for humans to coexist with a plant like this? Well, starting building a thinking of the Bible, yes, of course, people coexisted with all the, the, the plants that, that God created, but we have photographic evidence. The Wollomai National Park, they discovered one in this national park, I think they actually then named it the Wollomai National Park, New South Wales, 1994. And uh, they've been doing, uh, is it grafts? They do grafting um, of, of the plant and have produced more of them. It's alive today. Right? It's, it's a, like a dinosaur plant. You find this fossilized together with dinosaurs. It's like having a, a living dinosaur today, but in the plant kingdom. Right? So yes, we, we coexist with them. There's plenty of evidence. What about this? Again, now we're stretching our minds again. Tyrannosaurus rex. Could humans have coexisted with the Tyrannosaurus rex? Yes, they must have, if we believe God's word is true. So here again, we believe it because the Bible says it. But here are some stories to, to back it up, all right? Mary Schweitzer, North Carolina State University, some years ago she discovered a T-Rex femur, that's a thigh bone, over in Montana. And she sliced it open and inside she discovered red blood cells, all right? What you're looking at in those photos is red blood cells, uh, proteins, things like that, uh, ligaments from a Tyrannosaurus rex bone. And she did these experiments, she thought, what is this, this can't be real. And she thought, surely I've made a mistake. And she repeated the experiment, same thing. Fresh, uh, it's blood cells, um, it's right there under her microscope. She did the experiment 17 times. And yes, it's, it's a T-Rex bone with soft tissue on the inside. Uh, more recently, Dr. Mark Armitage from California State University also went to Montana, uh, ended up digging up a triceratops horn. Same thing, sliced it open, used his, his uh, lab equipment. What did he find? Red blood cells. All right. The difference, though, between Mary Schweitzer and uh, Dr. Mark Armitage is Mary Schweitzer is committed, remains committed to the millions of year paradigm, the millions of year timeline. She was given a grant of tens of thousands of dollars to try to research and figure out how red blood cells could survive for 65 million years. Is she allowed to question 65 million years? She's not allowed. She, well, she, should, she ought to. Absolutely, she should. Uh, what's, what's the logical thing you would do? Is say, well, maybe millions of years isn't actually true. But it's set in stone. Pardon the pun. It's set in stone. It's, it's, you can't challenge it. 
All right, and so she's given the grant. You can't question the millions of years, but you try to work out how this can actually happen. Dr. Mark Armitage, who's a, a Christian, who is a young earth creationist, he said to his colleagues, this fits with the Bible quite nicely. Red blood cells, uh, re more recent death of this triceratops, and uh, no problem at all for uh, a young earth. Right? It, it fits uh, with what the Bible says. He got fired for saying that. He lost his job for daring to challenge the millions of years view. Uh, you've noticed the artwork out, the, out uh, there as well. Uh, there's a story behind all of these pictures. So this is that's Montana in the background, uh, the T-Rex and the Triceratops there for a reason right, that goes with uh, with that uh, story. Here's another one. Spectacular dinosaur has skin, horn, pigments. The world's best preserved nodosaur, it's similar to Ankylosaurus. The world's best preserved nodosaur stirred wide interest when it went on display at the Royal Tyrell Museum in Canada in May 2017. Its skin scales, fearsome shoulder spikes, and possibly even skin colors prompted fossil pigment expert Jacob Vinter to tell National Geographic that it might have been walking around a couple of weeks ago. I've never seen anything like this. Now, of course, does he actually believe it walked around two weeks ago? No, but he's, what he's saying is it is that fresh. It looks that new, it could have been. Here are some photos of it. Right, that's uh, the world's best preserved uh, fossil discovered in Canada. Uh, I did a picture, that's what inspired this, this picture of the um, Ankylosaurus. And uh, who's seen diagrams like this? Fossils dying, getting, getting covered over millions of years, slowly turning into a fossil. Uh, it just doesn't happen. And if you tell somebody it doesn't happen like this, they'll say, well, who says? Right? They'll, you'll, you'll have the, maybe a bit of a, uh, an argument. You know, they might say, well, how can you just say that this book is wrong or these diagrams are wrong? Well, look at this. This is a, a southern right whale. And uh, tell me, what happens when a, a creature... Uh, dies in the water. What happens? Who's ever had a pet goldfish? Anyone? They float. They float. Right? It's, we, 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 we observe that. This southern right whale was found floating off the coast of South Australia. And it was a, a very dangerous situation because there were charter boats taking people out to have a closer look at this carcass and especially the great white sharks that were swimming around tearing chunks of flesh off it. And look at this. Look at this man and this one over here. Right, very, very uh, dangerous, irresponsible behavior that the Harbour Police were called in, the Harbour Patrol. They got the people out of there and they decided they have to get rid of this carcass. And do you know how they did it? They blew it up. And they took about three attempts, three, three charges to try to blow the thing up to actually get it to sink. What is the point of this story? Things float. It's difficult to, to get things to actually sink and then get covered over for millions of years and, and whatever. That's just a story that people have made up. It's assumptions. The reality is things float, they get attacked by scavengers or sharks, and do they become fossils? No. no. What about this one? Who, anybody here know their dinosaurs? This is an ichthyosaur, I thought well, it was a sea creature, all right? Uh, uh, allegedly millions of years uh, from the past. Uh, what is it about this ichthyosaur fossil that tells us it was not just swimming along and then died and then sank slowly and then over long periods of time was covered over? There's a clue in there. What do you see? It's, it's intact. Good. Right, so nothing's been ripping it apart. It's giving birth. It's giving birth, exactly. Right, there's a little ichthyosaur over here. Right, it's in the process of giving birth and some catastrophe happened and it's snapped frozen in time as a fossil. Rapidly buried, no scavengers could come, and that's why we actually have the fossil. Here's another one, a fish in the middle of eating its lunch. Some catastrophe happened, rapid burial is required, doesn't float, etc. Right? And that's how we get the fossil. Other fossils we find, looks like a T-Rex. Uh, oftentimes they are in this, this classic, it's called an asphyxiation pose. It's struggling, gasping for breath. It's being smothered by mud and debris. <coughs> And uh, it fits quite well with what the Bible says about a global flood. If there really was a global flood, what would you expect to find? What's the phrase? Billions of dead things buried in rock layers, laid down by water all over the earth. And that's what we, exactly what we do find. Uh, plenty of evidence for Noah's flood. Whether we talk about 
fossilization or even petrification. Right? What is this? Somebody's teddy bear. It's petrified. It's turned to stone. There's a, a, a waterfall in England which has a very high mineral content. It's a tourist attraction. You can bring your teddy or a tie or article of clothing, soak it in the waterfall, put it up on a ledge and come back in only a matter of weeks and months and it's petrified under those conditions with the, the, the water, with the high mineral content. This is a stone teddy bear. We have a, a felt hat that is turned to stone, retrieved from a, a mine that collapsed. Uh, the time that elapsed was about 50 years, went from a felt hat into a hard hat. All right, so when somebody says, what about fossils? We can be prepared. We can talk about living fossils, like the Wolomite pine, the coelacanth. We can talk about soft tissue fossils, like the T-Rex femur and the uh, Triceratops horn. And there are 40 others you can research on the website as well. Rapid burial, we can talk about asphyxiation, even petrification. Right? Plenty of examples we can use to back up what we believe. Counter-argument. Well, what about rock layers? Don't they prove the Earth is millions of years old? All right, how do we answer that? How can we be prepared? One way we can be prepared is to talk about these rock layers. Anybody recognize that? Uh, it's actually called the Little Grand Canyon. But yeah, it's, it's, it's very, very similar. It's, uh, yeah, it's a valley, you can walk into it, and it comes from Mount St. Helens. All right, you might have heard of Mount St. Helens volcano in Washington. It erupted in 1980, May 18, 1980. This is the before. This is the after picture, right? And it, it, it kind of uh, erupted partially sideways, changed the topography, the uh, river was backed up, there was a natural dam that was created as a result of this uh, eruption. 1982, only a couple of years later, the dam burst and the water cascaded and, and carved a canyon through the volcanic debris. And that was the picture that we saw, All right? So, if you went there in 19, if you walked into this, this canyon, Little Grand Canyon, in 1982, how old would those rock layers be? Two years, a couple years. They were laid down in one afternoon, right? Two years later, the, the water carved the canyon. And uh, if somebody was not aware of Mount St. Helens erupting, right? Take an evolutionist uh, in there who has never heard of Mount St. Helens, they'd go, well, look at this, one million, two million, three million, right? They would just add up, <laughs> make their assumptions about the age. All right, here's a person sitting down the bottom, standing at the bottom of the, uh, uh, the canyon. I mean, look, look how high that is. Rock layers, only a couple of years old. Right? Now, I'm not a scientist, but I can, I'm not a geologist like, like Taz. I mean, Taz is a geologist, he can give you all the details about, about this, but I can read the magazine, I can basically tell the story about Mount St. Helens. It's not that hard to do. It's good to have that up my sleeve so I can uh, justify, you know, rock layers, they don't actually take millions of years. So what about rock layers? Don't they prove the Earth is millions of years old? Mount St. Helens shows that rock layers do not require millions of years to form. So if you find a fossil way down here, you don't have to assume that it's millions of years old. So let's, let's take this reasoning a little bit further. If dinosaurs coexisted with men, imagine you're you're having a discussion with someone, you, you've, you've led them this far along, all right? They're thinking, okay, I understand the thing about the lions, the tigers, the you know, death after Adam, etc. Surely there must be evidence. If dinosaurs coexisted with man, where's the evidence? Well, there's plenty of evidence. This is a early Mesopotamian cylinder seal. Tell me, what do these animals look like? That's the seal up there. You roll it across clay. Uh, what, is it, what is that creature? What does it look like? Yeah, that's a long-necked dinosaur, some kind of a, a long-neck um, sauropod. If you visited Carlisle Cathedral, anybody here from England or been to England, visited um, England, there's a cathedral called Carlisle Cathedral. If you go down to the basement, there is a tomb, Bishop Bell's tomb, it's called. And there's brasswork all around the tomb, and it has carvings in it of various animals, including this, and this is from medieval brasswork around Bishop Bell's tomb, Carlisle Cathedral, England, approximately 500 years old. Only 500 years ago, we can assume if they carved them, they saw them. I think that's a reasonable assumption. If they carved them, surely they must have seen them. 
if they found a bunch of bones, I mean, you know, paleontology goes back to the 1800s, I guess, when, when fossils were being uh, discovered. This looks like somebody has seen the creature and has carved it. Notice the tail. The tail is actually up in the air, like scientists tell us it would have had its tail swaying, sort of dragging on the ground, like some of the early inaccurate uh, dinosaur pictures you might remember from uh, years ago. Uh, look at them. Surely that's, that's dinosaurs. There's nothing alive today that, that resembles that. And artwork again. Uh, by the, the reason I'm showing these is I just thought of this um, this morning. Um, if anybody does subscribe to Creation Magazine, I'm willing to you know, have this as a freebie. Right, you get the Creation Magazine for free, and you're welcome to have one of these pictures to have uh, to have, take home for free and tell the story. All right, we have this at our markets outreach. I have one display, and people look at it and go, "What is? Why is there a castle with with dinosaurs?" And I can tell them, "Well, let me tell you about this tomb and this carving." Right, and then from there we go to the gospel. Uh, who's been to Cambodia? Anyone? This is the, the temple of Tarpong in Cambodia. Uh, in those columns, those pillars, there are animals carved, including this one. This is a stone carving on the temple of Tarpong, Angor Complex, Cambodia, around 1200 AD. And what do you see? What does it look like? Who knows the dinosaurs? Uh, Jonah, do you know any dinosaurs? You don't? No? Who can, who can name this one? Stegosaurus, right? Plants across the back. And there's a picture of it too. Right? If you want to subscribe, have the, the picture, you can tell the story. There's a temple in the background. It's a Stegosaurus. Anybody been to China? Have you ever seen a picture like this before? The Chinese zodiac? Yeah, does it make sense that the Chinese would have a, a year of the horse, year of the sheep, etc.? All these animals that we're familiar with, and then randomly throw in a mythical creature. Does that make sense? Yeah, these are just animals that they were aware of in their history. There are books, right? Historia Animalia. This is from uh, about 500 years ago, roughly. Uh, a chronicle of animals like an encyclopedia, animals that were known to man, and there's a section on dragons. Right? So there's plenty of evidence from uh, history that dinosaurs and people did coexist. If anybody's interested later, if you look at the book display, there's, I think we have these on there, uh, Untold Secrets of Planet Earth, plenty of other uh, documented examples of pottery, carvings, drawings, tapestry, etc. Dinosaurs and people lived together. Let's take our imaginary friend a little bit further down this, this track. All right, dinosaurs coexisted with man. Wouldn't the dinosaurs have just eaten the people? Reasonable question, right? It's, it, you know, they'll, they'll say, you guys are crazy. People coexisting with dinosaurs. You know, uh, dinosaurs just eat the people. There's the end of mankind. The truth is, if we build our thinking on the Bible, Genesis 9, God said, the fear, this is speaking to Noah after the flood, God said, the fear and dread of you, right, speaking to Noah the man, the fear and dread of you will fall upon all the beasts of the earth. In other words, who's scared of who? Is it, is it people running scared of dinosaurs like on Jurassic Park? It's other way around. Right? The fear and dread of man, God would put into the animals to make them easier to hunt. Everything that lives and moves will be food for you. Just as I gave the green plants, I now give you everything. So uh, this is a movie that came out, uh, when was that, 2001. This is called The Lost World. Anybody familiar with Sir Arthur Conan Doyle? He's an author, an uh, English author, uh, classical books, Sherlock Holmes, I think, you do Sherlock Holmes. Uh, he wrote a book called The Lost World, and the BBC did a movie of it about 20 years ago. In the movie, these people end up on this high plateau somewhere near South America, and uh, discover this lost Indian tribe and dinosaurs that have survived for millions of years. So there's a lot of evolution uh, woven into the movie. The reason I'm bringing it up here is there's this awesome scene in the movie where these two people are running away from an Allosaurus, running through the forest, the Allosaurus chasing them, and uh, the Allosaurus is just about to pounce on them. The jaws are snapping, very, very good uh, CG, very good uh, special effects. It's just about got them, and suddenly they drop into the ground. Right, they're falling into the earth, and it turns out in the movie they have fallen into a dinosaur trap. It's like a pit. It was camouflage, had twigs and leaves on top, but they fall into this pit. 
And down the bottom, what do you see? Sharp spikes. All right? That's how you would kill a large beast. Yeah, man is intelligent. We can devise ways to hunt and kill a Spinosaurus or a T-Rex or any other large creature. And uh, the Allosaurus skids to a halt, it overbalances, and it falls down onto the, the wooden stakes. All right? uh, just an illustration of how people could, could actually hunt uh, dinosaurs. And there are other scenes in the movie depicting that as well. So if you get a hold of it, recommend it, uh, just, just for that sake. I mean, it's full of evolution, right? But it's a very entertaining movie to watch if you're into dinosaurs, which obviously I am. But Jonah isn't. One of the first boys I've met. Not yet, but it'll come. Probably. <laughs> right, so if dinosaurs coexisted with man, shouldn't the Bible say something about them? Anybody know about the dinosaurs in the Bible? Who's heard of them? What are they called? One of them is called Behemoth. Yeah, Leviathan is another one. Behemoth in Job chapter 40 is described as this massive creature. Its tail sways like a cedar. And this, I googled cedar trees. This is what came up. Right, this man is standing next to a cedar tree. Uh, it can't fit in the photo. Right, but this is just the, the base of the tree. And if that's how big it is at the bottom, imagine how tall the thing is. And imagine a creature having a tail like that. So, could it be an elephant or a hippopotamus? Does that fit with the tail? Of course not. All right? But at a certain point in time, when dinosaurs had been hunted to extinction, when, when they had basically died out, no more dragons around anymore, uh, people, I guess, forgot about them. They kind of faded from their memory. And uh, Bible translations even, like the King James Version that came out in the 1600s. The King James Version, I have a copy um, uh, at Job, Footnotes down the bottom that reference, maybe this thing was an elephant, right? Um, a hippopotamus, things like that, in the footnotes of the King James Version uh, Bible. Modern uh, Bible translators as well, they have taken their cue from the King James, and I have an NIV Bible. I've actually whited this out in my Bible, but my NIV Bible at Job 40 says, yeah, perhaps a hippopotamus or something like that. I've got some white out, I just neatly got rid of it. You know, it's just evolutionary thinking creeping in to even Bible translators' minds. Uh, somebody, so it would have been what? Some kind of a sauropod dinosaur with a tail like a cedar tree, something like that. Somebody mentioned Leviathan, all right? It's, if you read Job 41, his snorting throws out flashes of light. His eyes are like the rays of dawn. Firebrands stream from his mouth. Sparks of fire shoot out. Smoke pours from his nostrils. His breath sets coals ablaze, and flames dart from his mouth. Is that biologically possible? Who knows of a creature that can actually do that? Well, dragons, we have dragon legends all over the world. That fits quite nicely with the biblical record of history. But there's an animal alive today, a creature called the bombardier beetle. Who's heard of this one? Some of you, uh, the bombardier beetle from South America. It has the biological mechanisms uh, inside its body, different chambers, different chemicals, that it can mix together. And when a predator comes along, uh, it creates explosions. There's an inhibitor chemical that stops the chemicals reacting inside the body so that it doesn't blow itself up. But as soon as it's ejected away from the inhibitor and contacts oxygen, you have this chemical reaction and then there's this pop, pop, pop explosion where um, it's about 100 degrees, there's smoke, all right? It exists today. So, and, and, and uh, I encourage you, uh, get on, uh, YouTube, Google it, watch some, some video footage. There's an incredible, I forget, um, I posted it on Facebook, uh, some footage of this creature. It's just amazing what it can do. And I think it's fairly reasonable. If, if this exists today and can produce smoke and hot gases and 100 degrees and all of that, well, maybe other creatures could as well. Uh, who knows what Leviathan was? I don't know. Uh, some say Psychosuchus. It has this mysterious uh, thing, uh, at the end, like a, a hollow chamber at the end of its skull. Some scientists postulate maybe, maybe uh, it had sacs with the different chemicals in it. Maybe Psychosuchus could have been um, uh, what the Bible calls Leviathan, Spinosaurus maybe. Uh, we really don't know. We just don't know. But it was fearsome. Whatever it was, you wouldn't want, you couldn't kill it. You read Job 41, it wasn't afraid of spears or any kind of weapon. That was one dinosaur you would probably run away from. You wouldn't, wouldn't want to get near it. I googled T-Rex. 
right? And it came up with this thing. Isn't that ridiculous? <laughs> right, you Google T-Rex, go to images, and then you get pictures like this that come up. Uh, T-Rex with feathers. Uh, it's just silly. Right, so our imaginary friend, we're trying to reach with the gospel, we're trying to say, look, the Bible really is credible. He'll say, but we know that dinosaurs evolved into birds, don't we? All the scientists talk about that. Don't we know that's true? Everyone's, everyone says it. Right? I read this in the paper. T-Rex evolved into a chicken. T-Rex becomes today's chicken. They seriously believe that. That is part of their thinking. Right? This is my son, Jordan. Now, he's actually 17 now. My, my third boy. And uh, we went some years ago, we went down to Canberra. This is the National Dinosaur Museum. And I, we were walking in the car park, saw the big sign. I said to my kids, this is going to be awesome. We're going to see some fossils, some dinosaurs. But there's going to be a story behind the fossil. All right? Let's look at the fossils. Let's read the story. Let's remember it's just a story. We walked in, and sure enough, there's a velociraptor or something. And there are the feathers. All right? It's just you see that more and more these days. Who's seen Jurassic Park? Probably all of us. No. Well, who really? <laughs> you should. Yeah, it's. I mean, it has evolution in it. Uh, it's. It's not everybody's cup of tea, but um, uh, I enjoyed the movie. It's just. It's good for a laugh. And this is what the Velociraptors looked like on Jurassic Park. And the producers got feedback from some evolutionists that said the Velociraptors looked way too reptilian, because we know that they evolved into birds. So you should have had feathers on them. You should have had them moving, you know, like, like a, a bird, you know, pecking things, and then should have had feathers on them. And so if you watch the Jurassic Park movies, this was, I think it was early 90s, uh, mid-90s, Jurassic Park 2 came out. And I think it was the very early 2000s, Jurassic Park 3 came out, and this is what they look like. You see the difference? You watch Jurassic Park 3, and they have bowed to pressure from certain evolutionists, and the velociraptors are sprouting feathers. Then there was a reaction against that. And I think even, I read somewhere, I wish you could find the quote, but children wrote in and said, please, Mr. Spielberg, please, please don't put feathers on the T-Rex. Or I will never forgive you. They didn't actually say that, but it's along those lines. Please don't wreck uh, the T-Rex. And thankfully, in the latest um, series of movies, Jurassic World, right, there's Jurassic World, there's Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, there's a third one coming out, uh, maybe next year or year after. Uh, they returned to having the velociraptors looking reptilian, right? And all the kids breathe a sigh of relief. Yes, this is what they should look like. We don't really know for sure, but this is a whole lot better than feathers, isn't it? Yes. We don't really know. All we have is the fossils, but um, they look pretty good in the movie. And look at this article. Jurassic World, scientists criticize dumb monster movie for lack of feathers. There they are, complaining again about um, Jurassic World. National Geographic did an article some years back. Uh, it's a missing link between terrestrial dinosaurs and birds that could actually fly. And it's this article about um, a dinosaur fossil with feathers. There's your proof, the Bible's wrong, evolution's been proved correct. When it was examined more closely, this is from the National Geographic website, turns out the head and body of a primitive bird and the tail and hind limbs of a dromaeosaur were glued together by a Chinese farmer. Now, and there's some very clever Chinese people, they can make money out of this. They can sell it to any willing uh, university professor or whoever, and yeah, there's your so-called evidence. So I'm very skeptical. I'm very skeptical of um, uh, dinosaurs having feathers. Uh, I don't really see the point. Uh, uh, Dinosaurs and birds, they breathe completely differently. Reptiles breathe in and out, like we do. However, birds have a circulatory respiration system. It's hard to even imagine evolution happening in the first place, but how can one breathing system evolve into another? What did it do? Did it hold its breath for millions of years? Rearrange its internal plumbing and then resume breathing? How could you even, if evolution was possible, how could you even do it? Even if there was a mechanism by which evolution could happen, it's just you can't imagine how this could ever take place. How could one respiratory system possibly evolve into the other? So I drew this picture just to make fun of the evolutionists, right? They believe that evolved into that. No way. It's, it's, it's a crazy idea. Some years ago, we were doing our markets outreach with creation evangelism. 
friend of mine came up with this newspaper and had this article, elephant-sized dinosaur breathed like a bird. And he said, Steve, have a look at this, you'd be interested in this. Had a look at it, read it, no surprise. You know, all they really have is a skull. How can you tell from a skull how the thing breathed? Right? We always have to ask ourselves, what is the actual evidence? They're good at telling stories, but what is the actual evidence? And I said to my friend, that is not really what stands out to me. There's something else that stands out. Let me ask you, if you were given this newspaper clipping, what stands out to you? Do you notice anything? Yeah, yeah. Anything else? There's something else. Look, look, look beyond. I said to my friend, what really stands out here? It's that. Mm. Very significant, very fortunate that it appeared on the same page of the newspaper. I said to my friend, I think this is linked to this. The article is about schools in Brisbane. Uh, they've become jungles. There are kids being expelled at unprecedented rates. Uh, kids that are defiant, kids that are uh, violent, throwing chairs, being expelled, attacking teachers. It's, it's just gotten out of hand in Brisbane. And I said to my friend, is it any wonder if kids are being taught from preschool, from toddler age, all the way through, that you are just an animal. You're just an animal. You're just an animal. You just evolved just by random chance. Right? No meaning, no purpose, no right or wrong. You're just an animal. Why not do what you want? Why not behave like an animal? If I'm an animal, I'll behave like an animal. All right, so very ironic, I think, that these two articles appear uh, together. There's a reason why some schools can become a jungle. Not all of them are, but in some of your bigger cities and then for various uh, reasons, you know, some, some behavior can really get out of hand. And uh, it's no wonder when you look at what uh, kids are taught uh, year after year after year. So could these stories be related? Yes, I think they are. But let's get back to our imaginary friends. Right, well, in this case, it's Dawkins, Harris, Delahunty. Uh, but evolution is science, right? They're, they're going to cling. Some of them will just cling to it. Evolution is science, isn't it? Well, what is science? Really, if you think about it, science is observable, testable, and repeatable. Anybody can do science in the present, regardless of what your views are of the past. We use our five senses in the present. We can call, we can call that operational science. We can design computers, airplanes, cars, etc. What about the past? As soon as you delve into the past, we might call that origins science. None of us have a time machine. We can't actually travel back into the past and observe what happened. Now, we can have a belief in creation, we can have a belief in evolution, we can presuppose what our uh, beliefs are about the past, but we can call that origins science. We might find a couple of bone fragments in the ground. Here's an evolutionist, he's found a couple of fossils, just tiny little fragments. Uh, he can make up a skull. He might even make up a whole animal and say, hey, I found uh, a missing link. This is uh, a half dog, half whale. Did you know evolutionists believe that dogs evolved into whales? Some kind of a dog-like creature evolved into a whale. So they, they, they would have us believe that creatures crawled out of the ocean onto land and evolved into land animals, and some of them changed their mind and returned to the sea, began swimming more and more and growing flippers. That's what they believe, and they, they're looking for evidence of some kind of a, a creature. It, it grew, I mean, how big is a, a, a whale? You know, to go from a dog-like creature to a, a whale, again, it's, it's as crazy as the T-Rex turning into a chicken. But you can, you can tell the story, you can get your article published, and um, Pacacid, as they call it, is perfectly intermediate, they reckon. A missing link between earlier land mammals and later full-fledged whales. That's not science, really. It's origin science. It's really a belief about the past. So, uh, I have a question. Natural selection and evolution. All right? This is really, really important. Can you tell the difference between natural selection and evolution? Let me give you an example of natural selection. Natural selection is information loss. Okay, that's just a very simple way to summarize what natural selection is about. Natural selection, and there's gonna be a quiz, I'll warn you, there's a quiz in a few seconds, all right? 
What is, what is natural selection? Information loss, right? Let's memorize that. You might, and that's, well, that's why there's a down arrow, right? We're going downhill. We're losing information. You've got a, uh, a couple of wolves having uh, puppies, and some of them end up with short hair, some end up with long hair. Let's put them in the outback. Which ones are going to survive, do you think? Long hair or short hair? Short hair, all right? Nature will select short hair for survival. We lose genes for long hair. Isn't that fairly simple? Right? Natural selection results in information loss. So it may stay the same, but it's either sort of travels along the same way, but sometimes nature will select some for survival, others are weeded out, and we have information loss. It's a down arrow. If we delve into the past, what do we believe about the past? Evolution from slime to people, that requires what? Information gain. Now be very, very careful about what you read, what you hear from uh, evolutionists, whether it's on TV, textbooks or whatever. They will confuse these terms. They will give somebody an example of natural selection, go, look, there's science, it's demonstrable, it's observable, we've proved evolution. What are they doing? They're, it's called equivocation. They're, 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 they're uh, swapping words. They're giving you one example of something that's true and then quickly calling it something else and saying, there you go, we've proved it. Okay, let me illustrate that further. This is from the Australian curriculum, one of the descriptors. The theory of evolution by natural selection explains the diversity of living things and is supported by a range of scientific evidence. Sounds reasonable, there's scientific jargon, right? The average teacher says, well, okay, that seems to make sense. Everyone talks about that on TV. Right? That's what I'm going to teach. That's the, the descriptor. Let's apply what we've just learned about those definitions. All right? let's, let's just rewrite this. The theory of evolution. What was that again? Information gain. All right, let's substitute that. The theory of information gain by information loss explains everything. The diversity of living things and is supported by a range of scientific evidence. Does it make sense? Doesn't make sense. It's illogical. Okay, it's illogical. All right, mutations is, is a common response. Well, you want more information? Mutations can do it. The sun shining on creatures and mutations and new information, that's how it uh, would work. Mutations generally give you what? Is that new information? It's corrupted, it's, it's, it's unnecessarily duplicated information that's already there, but is it growing feathers? Is there something new? No. You might find uh, occasionally a cow with five legs. Is there anything new? It's mutated, right? But there's no feathers, there's, no, there's nothing new, no new information. All right, let me just wrap this up as to uh, how we can use this material to transition from what we've learned so far to the gospel. What do you do if something is broken? Fix it, all right, you fix it. The Bible says in Colossians 1, for by him all things were created. It's speaking of Jesus. All things were created by him and for him. The Bible tells us sin entered the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin. It's broken, we live in a broken world. The word, Jesus, became flesh made his dwelling among us. What do you do if something's broken? You fix it. God, the creator, came into his broken creation. And the Bible says, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We were born in Adam with a sin nature. Remember, that, that was our problem that we established at the beginning. God is good, but it all fell apart through Adam's sin. The plant kingdom, animal kingdom, man. And we are born in Adam, as King David understood, sinful from birth. The Bible tells us, but he, Jesus, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. But that's the gospel. That message falls apart if death is just normal, you know, millions of years, life is an accident, you know, that's, it just all falls apart. It is incompatible. Uh, evolution is incompatible with uh, the Bible. 
2 Peter 3.13, Peter tells us, But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. So we're, we're over here at the end of our timeline. We started with a good God and a perfect creation, no millions of years of death and suffering. I mean, that, that, that timeline would extend back to Gladstone, wouldn't it? If we could draw that far, right? But it doesn't. It's a short timeline, about 6,000 years, perfect world, a good God in the beginning, broken world is where we're at now. What is at the end of the timeline? What do we have to look forward to? What does this new heavens and earth look like? What will the new heavens and earth look like? The Bible tells us, Isaiah 11, the wolf will live with the lamb. Straight away, our friend says, what, you can't say that? The wolf living with the lamb? What story would you tell them? Yeah, the lion and the pigs, the... Um, so the tiger and the pigs, the lion with the antelope, right? We can arm ourselves, we can be prepared. The leopard will lie down with the goat. What does a leopard normally do with the goat? Yeah. Eat it. But we are prepared with stories we can tell. The calf and the lion and the yearling together, and the little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. What is our friend... Uh, uh, Mr. Attenborough is going to say, the lion will eat straw like the ox. We say, yes. Why? The Bible says so. But we also have illustrations that we can share to, to show that this affirms what the Bible says. Right? This was in Creation Magazine a few years ago. Little Tyke was the nickname given to this uh, lion. There was a, a lioness who gave birth to some cubs. And uh, for some reason, the lioness ate and attacked its own cubs. One of them was rescued and given uh, to these people in America uh, on a farm back in the 1950s. And they found that this little cub uh, grew up on the farm perfectly tame. It would not eat meat. The article in Creation Magazine is called The Lion That Wouldn't Eat Meat. And there it is, some photos from these people. Look at the kitten. Does the kitten look afraid? No. Uh, the chicks, the little, uh, what, what do you call these, nuggets at McDonald's? Right? Is, is the lion going, oh, I'm going to have some little uh, nuggets? No. Right? It's just playing with the chickens, and they're not afraid. Uh, the, the, the lady herself, the owner, she's not afraid. She's feeding the lion milk out of baby bottles. There's a lion with a lamb. Lion licking, imagine a lion licking your neck. Is she afraid? No, because she's raised this, this, this uh, lion, and it never ate meat. They took it to a butcher. This is really weird, isn't it? Lions just don't normally do this. They took it to a butcher, said to the butcher, could you try to make this thing, our pet lion, eat meat? He couldn't do it. Tried all different cuts of meat, couldn't do it. Her husband actually said, let's put a drop of blood into the milk and see if it drinks it. What do you reckon? Wouldn't drink it, wouldn't touch it. No, wouldn't do it. So, uh, Revelation 21, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Isn't that a wonderful hope? That's what we're looking forward to. Our good God will return and restore things to the way they were in the beginning. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life. On each side of the river stood the tree of life. Might we ever hear about that? Back in Genesis, no longer will there be any curse. Where do we read about the curse? Back in Genesis. So here's a biblical timeline, just to summarize. Very good creation. Sin and death came into the world through the first Adam. The last Adam conquered death on the cross, rose again, and while on the cross, took the punishment for all of our sins. And we're looking forward to a new heaven and earth. We add in the millions of years, and what happens? We have death before Adam. We have a compromised gospel. We have a weird resurrection. Put yourself in the shoes of somebody that has no knowledge of the Bible. We talk about a man rising from the dead. It's just weird. It does, it does not connect. It doesn't make sense to the average person. We have a cruel God. You know, some Christians try to say, well, maybe God used evolutionary processes to get us where we are today. Well, that would be a cruel God. That would be a monster. That's not the God of the Bible. We would have an incompetent God, trial and error. Is this egg good enough? No, I'll try again, I'll evolve a bit more. Is this one good enough? No, 
right? eventually you get to humans, that's an incompetent God. That's not the God of the Bible. We would have an untrustworthy Bible and so on. Let's just get rid of those millions of years, stand firm on the Word of God. Remember uh, David Attenborough, what was his complaint? The worm boring into the eye of that poor child in Africa. How can we be prepared to answer him? Number one, how will we answer this judge? Number one, he's wrong. All right, uh, go to creation.com, research this. You know, just just uh, type in worm, Africa, I, all right, read the article. It's not true that the worm can only exist in a child's eye. Number two, as we've heard this morning, God is good. He made a perfect world. Suffering only came about through Adam. And number four, let's hold David Attenborough and those like him accountable right, to their own worldview. What was he referencing? Parasitic worm and a boy. In his evolutionary worldview, here's what it looks like. There's the worm, there's the man or a child. The parasitic worm and the boy are just different branches on the evolutionary tree, aren't they? Just random chance, just different bags of chemicals, just different, different creatures. What gives one greater value than the other? Does David Attenborough actually have a basis for saying the boy is more valuable than the worm? No. You can say, so what? What's your problem? Just evolving? Maybe the boy needs to die out. Maybe the, the worms need to inherit the earth. No? Let's hold him accountable to his own worldview. Right, so who cares? Just let the evolutionary process continue. So again, 1 Peter 3, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. 2 Corinthians 10.5, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. What's one of the biggest pretensions that's out there today? The theory of evolution. It needs to be demolished. It's a stronghold that needs to be demolished before people will seriously consider that the Word of God might be true. So Creation Magazine, getting back to the magazine, uh, like I said before, a free gift uh, if you choose to subscribe. Uh, today there's a form, you can uh, fill in the details and uh, Taz has some freebies as well, some pamphlets and uh, other items. Uh, uh, the, the dinosaur picture, if you want to choose one as well, uh, you're welcome to do that. Have a look at some of uh, these testimonies, how Creation Magazine empowers Christians. Here's how effective it is. This person wrote in, he said, I was converted when someone gave me a Creation Magazine. Then I subscribed for five of my relatives. Four of them have now come to the Lord. This is interesting stuff, isn't it? Now, who's learned anything new today? Right? Is, are these interesting stories, do you think, that you could, you could retell them, you could share with other people? Right? This man uh, uh, took out gift subscriptions, and four of his relatives have come to the Lord. This man uh, in the middle there, uh, he was an evolutionist. This is back in Gladstone. Uh, the stronghold, that was the stronghold in his life. And we, we chatted for, for weeks about creation and evolution. When he understood, finally, that natural selection and evolution are complete opposites, then he began to listen to the Word of God. Until then, he didn't think it had any credibility. But when he understood for himself these things are opposites, he realized his whole worldview was resting on a lie. Came crashing down, and the man got saved. That's, that's the day he was baptized. This is our Marcus Outreach in Gladstone. We have these uh, banners set up, the creation material, similar to what you'll see out in the hall. Uh, this is from just the other day, only a couple of weeks ago, uh, at the uh, Botanic Gardens in Gladstone. And we set up the, uh, the gazebo with the, uh, the banners and things, the creation material on display. People come in, they, they see the dinosaurs, they ask questions, we show them the T-Rex blood cells and the stegosaurus and all those sort of things. And so often, the conversation naturally progresses to the gospel. Why is this even relevant? Well, there was no death before Adam. You know, maybe dinosaurs and people did live together. Now, tell the stories that you've heard this morning. And people come in, they have a look. Uh, sometimes they buy things. There's a the T-Rex blood cells, and some of those images you'll recognize from the, the PowerPoint. So they're all on display. People have the opportunity to, to purchase material, just have a chat. There's my son, uh, Ryan, another son of mine. Uh, Marilise, another uh, young girl from church. 
So they come out and help. There's the other pastor of our church down the end, Yaku, that's his daughter. Uh, his daughter actually married my eldest son uh, only about a month ago. Uh, so anyway, there's the, there's the stall. We talk to people and uh, one of these pictures has my back issues of Creation Magazine. I've got a, a little rack with all my back issues, been, have, have been subscribing for years. I read them and I give them away. Right? And that's my challenge. Uh, to all of you today. There it is. See that on the right hand side. There, that's my old magazines. I give them away. Uh, we got a coffee. We got here this morning pretty early. I went to the bakery. Taz, I really appreciate Taz. We went to McDonald's the other day. He, just, he, he says, hang on. Goes back to the car, grabs his magazines, and then off we go into the Mac, or into the get a coffee. And he has a chat and offers a free creation magazine. Wonderful way to witness right? and amazing information. And uh, there are four issues that come out each year. It's accessible uh, electronically as well on up to five devices, smartphones, tablets, iPads, laptops, etc. All we need is your email address. Uh, with a one-year subscription, if you do decide to subscribe today, aside from the freebies, you get a, um, a free DVD. If you subscribe for three years, then uh, you get two free DVDs. There's a subscription form, Taz will um, show you that later if you like. Um, just fill in the details, uh, tick the box, write in your name, address, etc. Uh, if you haven't yet signed up for InfoBytes on a little slip of paper that um, uh, Belinda gave you before, you can do it again on here, just tick the box. Yes, I would like to receive the free email newsletter. <coughs> So this is how it works, Creation Ministries International, we feed into the local church, right, that's us. Because you think about it, this information you've heard this morning, is Jonah going to hear that at school? No. Or Leilani? No. All right, uh, are we going to hear it on uh, TV? Is David Attenborough going to tell us this sort of stuff? No. Who will tell them? It's you and it's me. All right, this is it, we're it, we're the Lord's army. You're not going to hear it on TV. All right, uh, but we can tell them. And look, this is how it works. Creation ministries. We link in with churches. We're inviting you to partner with CMI. Uh, I would, I would. Yeah, you know, my, my prayer is that there's going to be ongoing fruit from from this me from the meetings today. Ongoing fruit. How many of you can tell me? No offense to, to Pastor David. What did he preach on four weeks ago? I could ask. Kenny and Belinda, what did I preach on four weeks ago? Well, if, okay, we go through systematically through the book, but let's go further, two months ago. I mean, you'd have to think, all right? You'd have to think about it. Lots of interesting stuff today, but where will you be a couple months down the track? Oh, that was interesting, but now we just sort of move on and kind of forget. Our prayer is that you link in, you partner with us. And my challenge is sign up for the magazine Read it and give it away. Like, give it away. Is there a market around here anywhere? Yeah. Every three weeks. There you go. Sorry, the third Saturday of every month. Okay. All right. So let's partner up, right? Because we can we, we can do the, 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 the markets anywhere. We go to Gladstone, Calliope. You know, we can set it up somewhere out west. We're praying about opportunities to visit other markets in, in the central Queensland area and reach out to people and this is how it works all right you're the lord's army give the magazine or the other resources to friends family workmates put it in waiting rooms if they let you do that give it to your neighbors use it for outreach consider a gift subscription all right there are many ways that uh, that you can do that so uh, after the meeting again catch up with taz have a look at the um uh, the sign up form, there are plenty of other books out there as well, the Answers book, the Genesis Flood, uh, the other book on dragons I mentioned before, lots of fascinating material. Uh, some, some of it is for children, especially designed for children. The Creation Magazine actually has a children's section in it. Uh, so if you order it, if you want to subscribe, give it to your kids. Right? There's a section written just for them on their level. Plenty of DVDs as well, Stones and Bones. Okay, and so there's the big picture. Let's go into uh, this coming week. I'm gonna get uh, Pastor David to come and, um, and close off and maybe pray. Uh, but let, let's have this, this big picture view in our minds as we head out into the week ahead. We are living in a, a broken world. You will find people will identify with this very, very readily. 
You don't have to convince them that this world is broken. Just this morning we heard about a, a lady, very sad um, situation, and you were praying, uh, praying for her. Right? It's a broken world. People will agree, but you can explain why there's death and suffering, and you can give them hope for the future. Thank you, Pastor Dave.